certain stages and when it was switched on especially they came around in droves measuring the magnetic fields around it. In those days in 1968 we had Essendon Airport in Melbourne uh, Tullamarine hadn't been built and aircraft took off like flocks of birds all over the place and this particular plane had to bank on this evening the 6th of the 1st 68 in order to miss this flying saucer which then after it left the paper mills trundled off across the sky over here to the Q Boulevard so I had my camera loaded up with 400 ASA black and white 8 millimeter film and I took it and followed this UFO down by the roadside by the river and I got some spectacular film of a landing I had a sudden impression to look up and lo and behold this light in the sky was getting bigger and bigger and I realized it was going to land and um, it did land but I was so surprised because watching a UFO land isn't any normal event I was so surprised I didn't get a picture of the first landing and just as well because this was a landing by the men in black what we know as the negative flying sources but after I'd recovered from my surprise I did get uh, enough gumption to photograph the second UFO which came from Ashtar Command which was in hot pursuit of this first UFO and this is the one that landed uh, in the movie film I took. Now ten years later this is the spot where the flying saucer landed and I revisited the location and this is an approximate angle uh, of what I shot on my movie film ten years later on today. This picture was taken the morning after the landing. It left a burnt circle 60 feet big in the grass. This second picture was taken seven years later of the same burnt circle and as you see nothing has grown on the spot. Well now let's take a look at the burnt circle ten years later and see whether or not anything has grown. Yes, well, this is the burnt circle. Um, a lot of flying saucer landings leave burnt circles, and uh, nothing has grown on this one since the original landing on that particular night. And over the years, we've come back to the boulevard and checked this area and found no growth on the burnt circle. Along with Shaver, Colin Cameron claims to have had contact with the subterranean Deros and Terros here in Australia. This belief should not be dismissed too lightly. Ray Palmer came up with some astonishing details about Shaver's uh, experience. I think Mr. Shaver, well, he originally claimed that he spent eight years in these caves with these Darrow and Taro people, T being, e being integrative. And I discovered later, much to my embarrassment, uh, that he had spent these eight years in the Ypsilanti State Hospital for the Insane in Michigan. I contacted the doctors and they said he was catatonic. He lived in a world they even had to feed him, in this imaginary world of his. Except for one thing, when Kenneth Arnold uh, saw the flying saucers, I put together two and two and I said, is the man catatonic or is, is there something else going on? But I got 50,000 letters, we ordinarily get 50 or 60 a month, from people who said, Mr. Shaver is telling the truth. And not only that, I have been in the caves too. And I hear the voices. I've been hearing these voices now for, oh, for about the next seven years onwards, every night. And uh, until I started taking some infrared film, which I'd read in a book by, I um, can't think of his name now, but uh, Trevor James. And um, he had, at the suggestion of Ashtar Space Command, taken infrared photography and got these invisible flying sources. So I thought, well, as these entities were invisible and they were bothering me, I'd try some infrared film too. And that's where I got these pictures of these entities. And uh, after those nights, um, what was happening to me was I was starting to hear these voices, just like Shaver was, uh, saying I was going to die, saying they were going to get me, saying they wanted to stop me researching into flying sources, and generally trying to terrify me. But I was never scared throughout the whole thing. This is what's kept me going. Brilliant brains, including Nobel Prize winners around the world, 
are still puzzling not are there UFOs, but what are UFOs? We talked to Klaus Nobel himself. It's something that man cannot comprehend. I think it's very likely that uh, uh, there are unexplained phenomena and uh, uh, I certainly have many times hoped that they would come and visit us now and tell us here on earth uh, that uh, we are in the process of doing things that are not really in our best interest because right now it seems like we are self-destructive and I would like to have them to come visit us. My personal opinion today is that the flying saucers exist in our atmosphere, they are intelligently controlled, that they, are, they do uh, convey or carry uh, people just as real as you and I, except in a different sense. Personally, I'd say I'm an agnostic, if one can apply that term to the subject. Uh, I've seen many reports. Some of them are definitely weird, but until I see one, I don't believe. But I'm not going to say they're not there. Well, now, what are we to think of this kind of phenomenon? People claiming to see uh, things such as I did. There were 38 of us, and we all believe that we saw it. But of course, we don't expect other people to believe us if we if they don't want to. And I have very little time with the attitudes of traditional science, which behave much more like religious dictatorships in many instances than they do like open-minded scientific communities. We have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously. Why, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than, than flying saucers or, or people from Venus or anything as far as I'm concerned. If 15 million people did collectively see something like this flying over a major city as here in Perth, Australia, Experience leads us to believe that there would be a complete breakdown of the social order, like the riots in New York when the lights went out. In the MGM film Swell and Green, we get a taste of the chaos the future may hold. I wouldn't put it past this government that a cosmic water gate has been underway for the last you know, 25 years. And at the same time, I don't think it's, uh, I think as we're growing up, or well, from the government's point of view, uh, I think we've, you know, we're, we're, we've been adults uh, for hundreds of years, but from the government's point of view, uh, we're still growing up, and eventually they might want to tell us something about what they've uh, discovered over, over, over the decades. Uh, there is a rumor that was in U.S. News World Report a number of months ago that uh, Jimmy Carter might make a uh, uh, make some unsettling disclosures about the UFO phenomena sometime in December. Uh, it's perfect timing. I opened my movie in December, so it's perfect timing. There is a shyness and a reluctance on the part of many witnesses, and understandably so, uh, against reporting because too many have been ridiculed and the life has been made somewhat miserable for them. But at the Center for UFO Studies, both in uh, the States and in Australia, is that it is our standard practice never to use a person's name without their specific permission. So if any of our viewers have a what they feel is a valid UFO experience and have not reported it, by all means, I would say it is your scientific duty to report this and with the assurance that your names will not be used without your permission. A graduate nuclear physicist in America felt it his duty to report a sighting he shared with 12 other people. Perhaps he will prove, in the light of future events, to be the most credible witness of all. This rare official document was signed by the then governor of the state of Georgia, now the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> 